VR, where a lot of the games are actually extensions of existing games, where tens of millions of dollars are being invested in the platform, in games, and, and then leverage into their VR platform. Um, and the same thing goes well for mobile games. Obviously, not every game is relevant, and this is exactly where you know we'll try to cover as much uh, ground um, to see what works and what doesn't work. Um, one game that we want to look at is Romans from Mars, a game that we actually adapted from its original free-to-play mobile version um, to VR. I'll give you a quick reference to what the game is. So Romans from Mars uh, launched in 2013 as a mobile game. Uh, it's a 3D game uh, launched back in 2013. It got featured, um, worked pretty great arcade game that is covered with some free-to-play meta mechanic um, that allowed you to you know, shoot better uh, those aliens as they approach you. Um, the game did very well on mobile, you know, quite a few years ago, um, and provided us with a platform to take into, um, into new platforms. And when Oculus contacted us at the end of 13 or, a, you know, um, 14, early 14, um, and showed us what later became the Gear VR, we felt that this game was, was a great um, game to, to leverage. The reasons were the assets were already there. There was proven mechanic. Um, and the core mechanic, in terms of interfaces, was simple enough to adapt into the new platform where there are a lot of question marks about what interface the Gear VR will have. Would it have the side controller, a gamepad, or whatnot? The, that allowed us the flexibility to use it and adapt to the platform as it was developing and eventually launching at the end of uh, 14. Uh, what happened is we kind of laid out a lot of pointers for us, and since then we adapted a lot of mini games and wanted to share with you those pointers today. The first thing is that VR is actually a very extreme experience. Even mobile VR, um, people are getting immersed real, you know, real quick, and, and a lot of the tricks that you do when you create regular games and create uh, uh, extreme motions, uh, extreme animations, uh, really needed to tone down when you do that and, and a person is inside that environment. That's something that you need to consider, especially if your uh, game is, is a, a simulator game like driving, flying, you know, space simulators. You need to be aware of movement and you need to be aware of sizes of elements within the world that changes uh, in terms of perspective and how they look. Uh, in the world. One place where we've seen that when we uh, um, uh, brought in characters to the scene and they suddenly became more frightening or more crazy looking than they used to be when they're cute on the small screen, when they're just in front of you looking you in the eye, uh, it creates a kind of a weird situation. Second thing was actually very technical. Um, usually with mobile games, you're looking at uh, 25 to 30 frames per second, totally fine. 2D, 3D, whatever you do. It doesn't work that way in VR. With VR, even in mobile VR, you need to get to a consistent level of 60 frames per second for people to feel comfortable. Especially when you're working with 3D, that's actually a lot of, you know, it's, it's a big challenge for a lot of people. It requires deep understanding of how to run and create 3D scenes. Uh, both from the texture size, the amount of polygons, etc., in how that would translate running on a number of different platforms, especially in the more kind of wider Android-based uh, platforms that are out there. Um, those type of elements are being tackled by, by people every day on the higher-end platforms. People are talking about 90 and uh, 120 frames per second. So, um, and as phones get stronger and stronger, the requirement would actually get higher and higher and move eventually from 60 to 90 over the next two years. Something to consider when you are looking at your existing set of assets and moving them to VR. 
Understanding that, moving to the actual arena, to the actual assets of the game, you need to consider that people are going to look around, uh, whether they can or cannot move. They're lock, look, going to um, 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 not only understand where, you know, that, that they, they can look behind, they can look uh, above, and things need to happen there. The sizes and the way that you usually set up the arena for your mobile game need to change as well. The entire perspective, the entire depth of the environment from skybox to actual objects within the arena needs to be adapted to, to look differently. Um, when we tested our arena, we needed to change a lot of elements, both in terms of size and their location in the space around the user. We needed to create stuff that was happening behind the user and above the user, which wasn't there originally. And eventually, when we did that, and we started with the Gear VR, when we ported the game to other platforms like Cardboard, we needed to adapt that again for a lot of different platforms because of the lens sizes and the screen size involved. We needed to have people feel comfortable in whatever they have seen in front of them. You understand that you need to go into a higher frame rate uh, your environment and objects are set, they're the right size and the right uh, depth in, in terms of space. Uh, people are starting to look at the environment in your arena. Um, one thing that's very popular in games is giving people some data about what's happening, and that's called the HUD or status display. Um, there are a number of ways to tackle it, and we've seen, you know, the more games are out there, we've seen more and more ways to do that, basically covering into two ways. One is still trying to float that data in front of the user um, and the player, connect that into uh, some static element or not, uh, sort of like Iron Man uh, or, or an F-16 uh, pilot um, helmet. The other, which worked for us very well and worked for most people very well, is try to lock all that information into the environment. It's almost as an organic part of what's happening around you. And what we have done, and I'll show you a movie in a second, um, was to take all the, that information that I was talking about, your, your health, how many lives you have, how much mana you manage to accumulate as part of your environment. You can see the life, number of lives you have uh, on the flag there on the left, and the mana uh, was represented in a bottle uh, on the right side of, uh, of your castle. Um, um, we found that to be a very natural way. People got it immediately. And the other thing is that we find when we try to float that information in front of the user, people quicker uh, felt uncomfortable with that. Uh, apparently not everybody is an F-16 pilot. Uh, most of our players are not. Um, and that just doesn't click well with our minds to see floating information in front of us without any, any reason. So anybody that develops games know that a uh, big part of developing game is actually handling menus. Not the most fun part of developing games, you know, we're used to focus on the action loop, on the arcade side, on the animation, but people need menus. They need to start menu, they need to choose stuff, and menus are, are eventually getting to be a big part of your developing process. When you're taking those menus, especially from their 2D uh, environment, whether it's PC or mobile, into VR, you need to consider how to do that so it would be or feel more organic as part of your surrounding. Um, again, there are two ways to do that. Um, if you have already uh, an existing game, you can take all those assets and kind of project them in front of the user in a 2D way, but still in a way that would be fun and make sense. Or you can actually, or sometimes you need to invest more and move all those elements from the menus and creating an environment out of those menus, something that again would be and feel um, organic to the actual theme of the game itself. We've done that and, and actually had to move our menu system and created a room that included number of menus and, and contextual menus based on the uh, place where you were 
in the, in the actual flow of the game. So we got the menus. People are starting. People are choosing their first level. Um, they uh, get into the environment. Uh, they start to look around and play. Um, you need to make sure they're looking in the right direction. Putting aside technical elements like having the arena floats and trying to recenter some of the elements or your point of view, which is you know uh, being actually getting better and better based on the hardware that's outside, there is um, a need to redesign the space around the user. If you created a, simula a simulation game, usually you already have three D environment. But a lot of time, you don't. A lot of time, you have uh, an arena, whether it's top-down or side view, uh, that you need to cover. And then you never know where users would or players would actually look at. There are different ways to do that. It's uh, almost something that directors now face, not only in games, but also in movies. Uh, there is this new startup called Visionary, uh, who's tackling specifically that with some ideas about uh, where users should look and what would happen in the game or in the movie when users are looking at a different way. Eventually, today, we're using kind of a rough uh, set of tools like arrows, like lights, um, to direct people to look where we want them to look. At the same time, we want and do add a lot of fun stuff when people are looking the wrong way, enticing them to look where we want them to look, where the action is. One of the most important thing is controls. I've, this week in the conference and before that, this week, most people talked about controls are being very important. Number of reasons for that. A, they're very important. Most game designers um, really depend on controls to actually translate into the game mechanics and create games that are um, very much based and oriented around the controls that you have. Second reason is the controls, and controls specifically for mobile VR, are evolving and evolving very fast. Right? When Gear VR came out, there was only that side control, cardboard had one button that you could click or, or switch, and you know the um, market is moving very fast to include motion controls whether they're hand-based, leap motion-based, or um, based on the daydream spec, kind of uh, um, uh, six-axis motion controls. Um, I've laid out, and you know, later on you'll be able to see the presentation, I laid out uh, the number of controls that uh, we would see. By the end of this year, uh, we're going to see um, more and more the six-axis uh, motion control. Uh, beginning to dominate the market, um, you know, people really like it, um, and then um, we're really looking forward uh, to see the introduction of camera-based uh, hand control. Uh, Leap Motion is doing that. Others are working and using the internal camera of the phone to do that. And everybody that tried it know that it's a magical feeling to see your hands actually working in uh, in VR. When we launched. Romans for Mars, we didn't have all that. Uh, and we needed to rely on the basic controls, which is timed gazed, um, and then the tap, side tap, uh, that we had there. Um, and for Romans for Mars, uh, basically you just aim and auto shoot arrows to uh, get all those uh, alien Romans uh, from getting to your castle. Um, in uh, platforms, when we had side controls, you would tap them and evoke heavenly powers, basically, you know, lightning that were coming out of the sky to zap um, as many aliens as you can. Obviously, uh, that's heavily dependent on the amount of mana you have. A um, few more pointers, moving people in VR, you know, people try that, you know, where we are now, I think it's a common knowledge that that's that's a tough thing to do. Most people do not feel comfortable. What a big no-no is to um, you know, take control of the camera. Even if you move the camera, whether it's a roller coaster experience, um, shooter on a rail, you do not want to take the control of people's point of view as you move them around. Uh, that, you know, when that happens, that it's an immediate uh, uncomfortable um, feeling for every player. And as things get 
to be more and more VR, you actually need to dive deeper and uh, tune the experience. We talked about uh, speed. We talked about other elements, but usually there are big gameplay, gameplay elements, especially those elements where um, you, if, you, if you take free-to-play game uh, and, starts to, and start to adapt that. Um, a lot of the mechanics around free-to-play are based on grinding and then going back to menu and upgrading your users, your heroes, your elements within the game. Those elements need to be heavily tuned um, to, um, to be adapted to VR uh, in, in, you know, when next to uh, the arcade side of the game, the core loop. And then you take your game into the store, uh, especially on Gear VR. Um, and definitely, if you want to get featured on any new platform, you should expect um, a lot of you know, uh, feedback and back and forth between you and the platform owner. Um, Oculus, who's uh, kind of a gate manager for everything that goes on Gear VR, and then the Google uh, VR team that's handling uh, the cardboard, and, and now, you know, as things are getting toward uh, uh, commercial maturity, uh, Daydream, um, work in, in very active in, in uh, uh, making sure every piece of content that will be featured on the store uh, will be on par with their expectations and the level of um, user experience they don't want to see. For us, uh, Romans from Mars worked very well. Uh, it became a launch title for the Gear VR, uh, one of seven. Um, it later on translated to other platforms uh, all around the world. Uh, we just released the game in China on a couple of platforms there. Um, in, uh, it became kind of uh, the first go-to um, game that we are referencing. Today, when our uh, portfolio includes more than seven different games, uh, it still stands very close to our heart as, as the first uh, game that we have used to go into VR. Give you just a bit of a visual uh, reference to uh, how the game look. Um, you are later on more than welcome to uh, uh, come over. I have the game with me and uh, can give you some glasses to look at the game. You can download uh, Romans from Mars from uh, the Gear VR uh, store and from the Android store as well as the iOS uh, store uh, today. Thank you very much. I would like to ask about the question of vision-based input. One of the challenging that using any vision-based input is the latency add-on, the process, the hand signals to get there. It will slow down the uh, time from the respond to the game substantially, right? I'm, I'm all those elements, mainly on mobile phones, uh, really slowing down. Um, it need to be considered. Um, this is why you don't possibly see that happening now, uh, but we're working with some phone manufacturers who are already tackling that. Um, a lot of phone manufacturers um, rely on VR in general to run their newest smartphones. Uh, so I think as soon as early, very early next year, you would see stronger platforms that can handle those issues. In relation with his question, uh, the latency, uh, how much of that is contributed by the hardware and the software and the network that's connected for the rendering? Well, we are trying, and I think most games are trying not to rely on the network at all. It's too early for that. Bandwidth is tricky, you know. It could be good, it could be bad. You don't necessarily want to rely on that. Uh, so most of what you're looking at is the CPU and GPU of the phones. Um, and again, that's where you already have phones that are pretty good with that, and next year they're going to be even better. You mentioned that uh, Google and Oculus, they had strong suggestions, recommendations for things that they wanted for their platform from these games. Could you give uh, an example? Um, at the first level, they're really checking that you're on par with you know, frame rate, the use of um, controls as almost as a language you know, to interact with your environment. Uh, the comfortable level uh, that people may or may not feel when they're 
playing the game. Um, there's, you know, obviously elements of, of visual. They're trying not to get, you know, into that as much as possible. But uh, there's there's a set of sort of reference, um, um, you know, conventions of how people interact and kind of behave in those worlds that they they definitely look at. It's long list. Um, Google is actually very very nice in being in sharing a lot of those thoughts online. Okay, I think that's all the time we have. Thank you. Thank Dan. you very much.